So I'm here to tell you about a Chinese curse, which is something like, may you live in interesting times. I want to describe to you why I think you are in interesting times, and we're going to have a very transformative experience um, in the next decade or two. Um, I'm going to first go back to a little bit of history about the Industrial Revolution uh, and tell you about two cities that at least those of you who aren't grad students buried in your work will have been to. Um, you can see here New York uh, before the turn of the previous century and Palo Alto a little bit more than 100 years ago. Um, very pedestrian, not a lot of energy in use. Palo Alto does seem to have uh, electricity or at least telegraph at that point in time. In New York, you can still see a lot of steam power, beginnings of use of steel in one bridge. And these cities went through a crisis, an environmental crisis beyond belief. There was actually a meeting in 1894 in New York to solve the biggest environmental problem for cities uh, at that point in time. Anybody have a guess what that was? Yes, horse manure, exactly. Here's the problem. It's pretty messy, and you can see the quick math up there um, for uh, 72,000 horses. The problem is to cart all this horse dung around, you actually needed more horses, and to bring the hay in, you needed more horses. So it was an exponential problem. Um, yet, we don't live with this amount of horse crap everywhere today. Why is that? Because we went through the second phase of the Industrial Revolution, uh, we had a number of technologies show up and related to that a number of new business models show up that completely changed these dynamics, invalidated all the forecasts and assumptions, and changed the landscape of cities. Steel came in for buildings, elevators, thermostats, and the most neglected but actually significant innovation up there, the sewers. We actually got clean water and we got wastewater treatment systems, civil engineers can sing praises, that actually doubled life expectancy well before vaccines came in. Everybody thinks it's vaccination and penicillin, but it's actually clean water. As a result, we had electrification of transport. Uh, most of you probably didn't realize that University Avenue in Palo Alto actually had a streetcar system uh, and was a very convenient way to get around in the 1920s. Um, of course, by the 1930s, uh, more congestion and fewer trees than you see today, which I thought was kind of interesting uh, relative to what we're, the University Avenue we're all used to. In New York, a very modern industrial city, you see all the ships are beginning to be gone and transportation is driven by automobile and we have lots of energy. Just to give you a few highlights of how dramatic this transformation was, here's a few key stats. I already mentioned life expectancy doubled. The cost of moving goods, basically you could only really move goods by sea before the Industrial Revolution. It was 25 cents per ton mile to less than a penny. You had distances shrink dramatically, New York to Chicago, here's the example. Obviously cross-continent was typically a once in a lifetime journey before we had automobiles and trains and now airplanes. And light, most of you spend your evening studying. Well, you could have done that in ancient times, except you would have had to have the riches of a king. It actually took several days of labor to generate the income for one hour of light. Now we basically have an hour of light for fractions of a penny and we all take it for granted. This is the kind of dramatic transformation of all the infrastructure of transport of buildings of the energy system that we can again see that is in the, we're on the cusp of in our lifetime you can see here the previous Industrial Revolution led to more than an order of magnitude change in labor productivity. Very, very dramatic. That's why we talk about the Industrial Revolution you learned about in history books. Unfortunately, it has not really made much dent in this curve, which is resource and energy productivity. It's gone up slightly, but not nearly by the same dramatic improvement. In fact, most of the changes that I showed you a slide ago are because we substituted energy for human labor. We have two orders of magnitude more calories at our disposal. All of us flip on the light switch when we need it. Now we need to bend this curve and create the same productivity shift for resources this time, meaning energy, water, food, and so forth, not just for labor. And I'm gonna show you some glimpses of how. I don't claim to give a more accurate forecast than those forecasters that said New York and London were gonna be buried in dung, but I'll show you some intriguing examples of where that's already happening. First. The bad news part of the story. This is really a big challenge, unprecedented, um, not only in our lifetime, but unprecedented in human civilization. If you look at the Industrial Revolution, it's this curve. 
9 million UK citizens uh, going to 22 million, over 150 years doubling their income. And then what I just showed you in, for Palo Alto and New York is this plot here, which is the US catching up and doing that in basically one generation. Now we have two and a half billion people all over the world, but the single biggest constituencies are in India and China. Not only doubling their income, but actually going up eightfold, if you look at the math here, and doing it for two and a half billion, and doing it in about a decade and a half. So we've shortened the timeline, we have more people, and we're doing a more dramatic, because it's now catching up to global GDP levels. So that's a 10,000 fold change. Uh, those are biological reactions normally where people get sick or explosions where you get that kind of geometric increase. So the demand side looks pretty dire. And this is why we've seen these spikes in commodity prices. Obviously oil has come back down a little bit and we can talk about what are some of the changes that are already causing that. But in the macro picture, more people are consuming at the middle class level and consuming more of everything. At the same time, we're not actually running out we looked at all of the different commodity inputs, and for pretty much anything you find the same story, which is that yes, reserves are limited, but that's because reserves are what's mathematically possible at current technology levels to extract economically. Resources, what's actually in the ground, is a much larger amount, and what happens over time is resources turn into reserves as new drilling technologies, as new extraction, refining, processing technologies come to be. But this is the real challenge, it's an economic one. It's not a shortage, it's an economic extraction issue, which is we used to find nuggets of gold on the ground here in California in the Sierras, right? They were 99% pure or 95% pure and they used to be this big. Now you actually find one ton of gold for 22,000 tons of ore that you have to extract from the ground and from deep underground, they're no longer on the surface. Same thing for any other metal or any other commodity you look at, if you look at oil, we're not running out of oil, but we're having to go under salt formations far offshore into new places, and we're having to expend a lot more energy to extract it and bring it up. It also means that the cost per unit of extraction has gone up. So the marginal cost of every additional unit is rising. So that means we have a perfect economics challenge. We have increasing demand, and we have supply getting more expensive to extract. So you'd expect that this trend, which has held for 100 years, wouldn't really hold for our generation. And that's in fact what's happened. We've had almost a percent productivity improvement that most companies got for free, and we have not only reversed that trend, but we've set a new trend line that has actually erased 100 years of gains. You can see we're off the peak already. Prices are back down as the world economy has slowed, and in particular as China has slowed its infrastructure build out but we're still on fundamentally a different trajectory because of the two and a half billion people joining us as middle class citizens. So this is quite serious, but this is really only one dimension of the problem. The real challenge is this, and I've taken here what we eat as an example, but you could do this with transport, you could do this with infrastructure, which is we have <coughs> diversified into more and more commodities. If you look at beef and the increasing protein consumption, not only does it take more energy, but it takes more land and it takes more water. So all of these resources are we not only consuming more of, but you can't actually solve one of these problems in isolation. You have to look at the linkages. I show you this just as an example of how serious the water issue is. Many of you are aware of this and some of you have been working on it, but the entire western half of the US, all of northern China, huge swaths of India where all this population growth is occurring in the middle class um, are sev severely water constrained um, and it's actually as big an issue going forward as energy shortage or food shortage was in the past. The picture is basically this, which is you have these linkages of one resource being used for the extraction or the purification or the generation of another resource. As a result, a long-held belief that you make your investments less risky by diversifying them turns out not to be true anymore. Most of you are probably told that you should own some commodities, some bonds, and some stocks, and that therefore, on average, you do better, regardless of what the market was. Well, that was nice and true in the 1980s, uh, when Milliken and others invested successfully based on that. If you look at today, these are actually stunning correlations among otherwise completely unrelated commodities. So no matter what you're buying, you're essentially buying energy and buying oil. And it's because of the way that diesel fuel and, f and natural gas and fertilizer has suffused into all of our transport infrastructure, all of our food growing activities, and the entire way we operate cities. 
So it means that you can no longer solve one of these problems in isolation. You actually have to tackle the systemic challenge. It means I can't just solve my water problem by saying, well, I'll just generate a whole bunch more energy and pump water up from underground. And I can't solve my energy problem by spending more and more money and more resources on just getting more supply. Yes, I can get more supply, but it doesn't solve the systemic challenge. The only thing that solves that systemic challenge is actually shifting the production system and shifting the technology base to improve the productivity, because then you get more with less input. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And, and this is sort of the book in one slide summary, if you like. But essentially, that there are these five economic levers. Waste reduction, which is lean but now applied to the entire system rather than to a factory floor. Substitution, so this is substituting one technology for another, like electric motors for gasoline motors. Circularity, which is reuse at any scale. It can be recycling, but even more powerful is actually to do software upgrades or to make a product last longer. That's reuse, getting more use out of the same system, the same product. Optimizing, which is what we now do with software and Internet of Things and many other um, systems engineering technologies where we're improving the efficiency of, of a city as a whole or of a manufacturing environment. And then the last one is things that we used to make as products but that we now just consume virtually or digitally. This can be in the business environment, remote service, no longer sending out a truck roll, or it can be the media and content that you consume on your iPhone that you would have previously gone to purchase a CD or even a record in the past. I'm going to show you how these levers come into play in a couple example areas. First in energy. If you look at our energy system, we think we kind of have what we have and that's what we've been doing forever. It's actually not true. We, we think we're mostly oil based and power generation mostly coal based. If you go back in time, we shifted. Coal was actually a new energy source when we were all burning wood. And there are many parts of the world where that transition happened late and we have massive deforestation. We then shifted to mostly gas and oil in the US because for much of our transport activity, that's actually a more convenient, higher energy density, higher energy density form of energy. And if you look at the periodicity of this, we're roughly due for another change. Again, the historic periodicity is not necessarily predictive, but gives you an indication that this can happen over one or two generations. I'm going to show you why we still need to make a shift. And it's basically this chart, which Lawrence Livermore National Labs has been doing since the 1970s. And you can see in broad swaths that we actually waste more energy than we use for productive purposes. So more than half gets wasted. The interesting thing about this chart, comparing it to 1970, is we're about 10% worse than we were in the 1970s despite all the energy efficiency that California has pioneered. And the basic reason is we've taken energy that mostly used to go through electricity generation and mostly go into buildings, and we're cranking more of it through the petroleum chain through 30% efficient internal combustion engines and using more of the energy in aggregate as an economy for moving stuff around. And we move a lot more people and stuff a lot further, and that's through an inefficient branch of this pipeline system. Just to give you a sense of how big this is, we could basically power an entire European country for multiple years off just the energy we waste. So that gives you the scale on which we actually waste energy. How is the system changing? Well, a lot of utilities were surprised. I had conversations going back a decade saying solar is coming. Here's the learning curve. Here's the rate at which cost reduction is coming. Here's the year. 2012 was my prediction a decade ago when solar would actually be in the money for significant parts. But most utilities said, ah, niche technology, who cares? Why? Because they were looking at this. Here's all your different generation technologies bouncing along, and solar was this off-the-chart technology that was 22 times the price of grid energy. And then basically a meteor strike hit. This curve actually was entirely predictable. It has been following the same trajectory since the 1970s. And yet, from a utility executive point of view, it looked like a strike from nowhere because they weren't following what was happening in the semiconductor industry and other high-tech industries. They were looking at traditional fuel sources. This will be a theme I'll come back to because other industries will be similarly surprised. This is a chart that actually some of our students helped put together looking in different geographies, what are these learning curves and where are the crossover points? And one of the things that was a big surprise to us is if you look very closely at these curves up here for nuclear and for coal plants, 
they actually have been going up. Coal plants have been getting more expensive per unit of output since 1968, and nuclear plants since the third or fourth plant built, if you don't count the Navy reactors before that. So here is a technology in rapid cost decline competing with a technology that's increasing in cost over time. And yes, there are lots of things going on there. Regulation is part of the reason why uh, coal plants are getting more expensive, because we want them to be cleaner. But fundamentally, it's not a level playing field in competition. There is a crossover point in each of these geographies. Exactly how soon it comes depends on the amount of sunshine. We're pretty lucky here that that crossover point is very, very close for most of the state. But you can see even in places that today are completely coal dependent, like India, um, solar will actually get to a point where it will be the cheapest form of generation. So the rest of the utilities are still going to get hit by that meteor strike that you saw a moment ago. Unfortunately for utilities, this is only one part of what's changing in the entire landscape. So yes, the generation costs and the fuel will change, but a lot of other broader factors are changing. And those who said a couple of years ago that China is building one coal plant a year, it doesn't matter what we do in the US with CO2 emissions, because China's emissions will dwarf all of us, forgot about this effect, which is people don't like bad air when it kills their children. And so you can see the energy intensity of the economy is already coming back into line. Basically, China went massively out of proportion because it was the manufacturing center for all our stuff, for Walmart and all of the consumer goods that we buy. And therefore, energy intensity per capita ratcheted up. But that's going back into line now. And also, the number one priority right now is to clean up the air in the cities. So we shouldn't expect, in fact, if you look at the latest data, China's coal use is down for the first time this past year in the last 15 years, down for the first time. And it's because energy efficiency is increasing. It's also because there's less infrastructure being built. So the amount of steel used and other things that consume coal directly are down. But that's something we should expect. I'll come back to the amount of cement usage a little bit later. And you can see that even other emissions, like other countries, will ultimately peak. We shouldn't expect these things to continue indefinitely into a hellish environment where nobody can live. People innovate to get out of this. And you can see on this chart, this is an example of Massachusetts, but California is actually a very similar story, which is we've basically decoupled our energy requirements, and in particular also our greenhouse gas emissions from that energy requirement and from the GDP. So we can have growth and do that same growth, achieve that same growth with less energy, and we can have that same amount of energy services with less fuel input required and with fewer carbon emissions. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a productivity shift in the resources rather than in labor. To give you just some data points about how this is already happening, I'm not just telling a story about the future. This is the current best data on what's going to happen in terms of additions to generating capacity. Yes, the installed base all over the world is predominantly coal and in a couple of countries, nuclear. But if you look at the additions that are coming in year to year, they have basically already tipped. You can see most of it already shifting to renewables. And in particular, if you look at countries adding a lot of capacity, look at China, 12 gigawatts installed in China alone. They've installed as much in one year as we've installed cumulatively in renewables in our entire history. So it's a very dramatic shift. Some interesting examples where that is already, because solar, after all, is a zero variable cost, zero fuel cost technology. You would expect that once it gets cheap enough to be at grid parity, it actually reduces prices. And we're beginning to see that um, with a couple of utilities, both forecasting less load, but also forecasting lower prices as the costs come down. I mentioned, though, that this is not the only thing utilities are facing. Utilities are kind of in the perfect storm right now. I've got DG Solar cutting away my most profitable customers. I've got upgrades of lighting taking down the number one load in most buildings. And buildings are the single largest load in an electricity grid. So I've got LED basically making my lighting dramatically more efficient. More efficient. And I've got energy efficiency in the form of new air conditioning systems and better insulation and new building technologies coming in to also reduce my load. And you can see here the kinds of changes that we're talking about. This is in terms of the demand. If you actually look at this in terms of profits for a utility, you're talking about as much as a third of the profits simply going away over the next decade. 
So it's a dramatic change. This is why we've seen utility debt ratings actually already dropping over the last several years. And we've seen market cap destruction on a grand scale in European utilities who face much higher solar penetration already. There's one silver lining here. You can see the demand from battery technologies and electric vehicles and all kinds of other electric gadgets that we carry around will go up. Unfortunately, if you electrify the entire fleet in the US, that would be about a 10% increase in electricity consumption. So by itself, it's actually not enough to offset everything else, even if you electrified the entire vehicle fleet, which may eventually happen, but will certainly take some time. And it's really not a panacea for utilities either, because an electric car is like unplugging a building and moving it around and plugging it in somewhere else again. And that's not very easy for a grid to handle, at least not the way it's designed today. So there are operational challenges, even if the aggregate demand picture looks good. I'll show you two other examples of why these effects are coming in so strongly. I mentioned this cost reduction in light. You can see 50 hours of work for an hour of light with a sesame oil lamp down to 0.07 seconds. I bet most of you never thought about that. For an hour of light as you're sitting there, you're spending 0.07 seconds every hour that uh, you're studying. Um, basically negligible, almost free at that point. And we have the same dynamic in play for grid storage. And this is something most utilities have looked at but aren't really planning for the date sometime near the end of this decade or very early in the next decade when grid storage will actually be economic in many parts of the world in places that are lucky enough to have pumped hydro, it already is today. But that will completely change the entire system dynamics, right? Right now, utilities basically on the generation side make money when there's a shortage and, and prices fly up on the wholesale markets. Um, and lots of people are making money by arbitraging one region versus another. If I have inexpensive storage, all of those market dynamics change completely. So this results in what I call the four-dimensional utility, 4D, uh, and you see this as a kind of theme. If you put each of these here in the center, each of these dynamics, we're going to make the grid digital and automated. We're going to have new forms of efficiency and, and transport coming in on the right-hand side here. And we'll have storage. And the distributed form of the grid begin to take shape. You've got a grid with distributed resources, storage, generation, and demand distributed. You'll have as much information on the grid as we have in the communication systems today before we added video, so all of the voice and, and data signals we had before video. Uh, and no utility is set up to handle that amount of data today. Many utilities actually still do their bills by hand carrying a tape from one part of the business to another, if you can believe that. Um, the internet hasn't hit yet. And then, of course, disruptive technologies. And the single biggest change down in the right-hand side there, which is we can think of demand as something that we can dispatch as well. Right now, we built a grid to go one way and we adjust supply to meet whatever demand happens to be. But in a world where every device is digitally accessible, I can turn down your fridge, I can change when your air conditioner runs, when your EV charges, just as easily as I can actually crank in more supply. If you look at the way all our grids are engineered, they're engineered for peak capacity on the worst sunny day in the middle of the summer for places that have a, a summer peak for air conditioning, and then a safety margin on top of that. So I've deliberately sized my grid for two to three times what it really needs on a typical day. And I've built all of my capital and all of my infrastructure to support that level. If I can change the demand side, I actually don't have to build my grid that way, or I don't have to expand my grid that way in a country that still has growing load. You can see this already showing up financially. These are just stock indices. You can see the S&P 500 has done very nicely in the last couple of years as we rec recovered. Uh, from the massive recession. You can see that coal being phased out has already hit the valuations of the coal companies um, and is down about 50% relative to the overall market. So the Stanford decision to divest from coal is a little bit late, but actually obviously a financially smart one. And you can see on the upside, the new technologies are now outperforming despite the bad reputation solar and clean tech got from the crisis and the number of companies that went bankrupt in the, in the financial crisis in 08 and 09, which is not unusual for companies early stage to get weeded out, as most of you know, in Silicon Valley. Let me shift to transportation. Just to give you another example of this kind of transformation already beginning to take shape. This is an orthodox view of transportation. 
Uh, this particular view happens to be Exxon, but I could have picked any oil company. They all have massive groups doing forecasting for energy demand. They all create pictures they actually publish and announce, and then they aggregate them in, in the form of the IEA. And you basically see variations on the same theme, which is it is pretty much business as usual. We have the same fuels with the same mix of vehicles. Um, and of course, the economy needs to grow, so we need more cars, so therefore we need more oil. Basic argument. What's interesting is if you look at the last round of estimates in the, generated in the last year or two, depending on exactly which company, you see this electric vehicle beginning to come in somewhere 2035, 2040. Again, the exact year depends on which oil company's forecast you look at. That looks interesting. So I went to them and I said, what's changed? What's, why, why suddenly electric vehicles? And they said, well, that's when batteries get to be about $150 a kilowatt hour. Uh, and they'll be in the money. I said, exactly right. There's only one little problem, the meteor strike. If you look at the learning curves for battery technologies, and some of you here at Stanford are working on these, we're actually going to hit that number somewhere near the end of this decade or maybe a couple years beyond that. So the oil companies are going to get hit by something that was entirely predictable and is exactly on schedule, but in their worldview will be about 20 years ahead of schedule and will be very surprising. Um, so we have another transition coming, and I want to show you just how dramatic this is, not just in terms of going electric, but actually the rest of these dimensions. How many of you own a car? Okay, good part of you. Where's your car? Parked, yes, parked. It's parked all the time. It's parked 96% of the time. In fact, those of you who are students and don't own a home yet, this is probably your single biggest asset purchase. And if you really do the numbers and don't count the fact that you're actually looking for parking and sitting in traffic 2% of the time, you're getting 2% return on that asset, 2% real use going A to B on your largest investment. Um, so that's pretty poor asset utilization. You can see why our economy is very inefficient on this particular dimension when you look at it with a resource lens. This middle analysis is from the 1970s. Uh, Amory Lovins did this back then already. It's improved a little bit in the US as we put in cafe standards, but not dramatically, because we still basically have one car, uh, one person per car, or 1.2, 1.6 people per car, depending on which area you look at. And we still burn fuel in our cars mostly to heat them. So we have 1% of the fuel that you pump in at $4 a gallon actually really goes to moving you from A to B. The rest moves either steel around or results in extra costs in the form of brake wear, tire wear uh, that you have to pay for. We also accept that for the people in the middle of their life, 25 to 40 years old, automobile accidents are the leading cause of death. You're more likely to die in a car accident than you are from any disease, from Ebola or any other of the scary things that get a lot more attention. We fundamentally accept that this structural deficit in our transportation system is just a fact of life. It doesn't have to be that way, by the way. We've reduced deaths in air transport dramatically over the same time period by introducing autopilots and new safety systems that we haven't done for vehicles. And then the really shocking one when I actually ran the numbers. We spend about a percent and a half of GDP on our transport infrastructure, parking lots, roads, the Eisenhower interstate system. And basically, if you multiply together how many cars are on it at peak load when it's really flowing smoothly and not a traffic jam but busy, and what percentage of the time that actually occurs, which is basically five times a week in one direction, not counting all the holidays, you get to half a percent of utilization of all that infrastructure spend. Most of the time, most of our roads are empty which is, of course, what you see in car ads, but not what we encounter the few times a day that we actually want to use our roads and we sit in congestion. So that's the same thing on a national level where we're spending a huge proportion of our wealth and our infrastructure spending on a system that is getting absolutely terrible utilization. And it doesn't have to be this way. You can see already in the emergence of sharing, in the emergence of electric cars, and in the emergence of new systems that allow you to drive autonomously or that allow you to form pelotons or convoys so that you can reduce the spacing between the cars that get you to something like this. This is basically, if you go today and you take a, a mid-sized car, it's about 67 cents per mile all in to drive. If you drive an SUV, 
it's a little over a dollar, dollar ten, dollar twenty, depending on just how much of a gas guzzler it is. And it'll take it to below 10 cents a mile. And the way that happens is not only each of these technologies, we electrify and we go from that 1% efficiency to somewhere 60 to 80% efficiency. We can take it and share the car and go from 4% average, 15% peak utilization. Think about what that really means. At rush hour, 85% of cars are still parked somewhere. They're all sitting idle. And we can take it to the typical usage of a fleet that's well managed is somewhere around 55, 60%. And we can reduce most of those accidents. AAA estimates and, and highway department estimates are about 90% of the accidents involve human factors. So you won't remove the random tree falling on a car, but most of the accidents because somebody didn't pay attention or was texting or was distracted or didn't see their blind spot, most of those we can actually prevent through technology. We may introduce some through technology too. If you look at some of the recent airplane crashes, it's because pilots didn't actually understand how the autopilot worked and what it was doing. So there's some precautions there, but many of them we can clearly eliminate. But what's most interesting from an economic point of view are actually the interactions. So far, most companies have looked at one of these and focused on getting that out into the market. But if you combine them, and I make my car connected and I know exactly where to charge and where to go to charge, or I have the car just be autonomous and go and plug in when I don't need it, I can have much less charging infrastructure, I can have much less circulation and people just cruising to find a ride, whether it's Uber or a taxi. Um, a big part of congestion in cities, in New York the estimate's about 40%, is just taxis looking for passengers. Um, no one so far has run the statistics on Uber in San Francisco, but I'm willing to bet that it's actually quite similar. A huge part of the traffic congestion is now Uber drivers waiting for rides. And by the way, the last five that I took have all come from way outside the city, everywhere from Santa Clara to East Bay, and converged on San Francisco to actually drive there. So still improvements left for that model. Um, to, if you look at the sharing and electrification, the reason we don't all have electric cars is because they're very expensive and they have limited range, right? Is that so holding you back? There are $40,000 or more to buy, and then you can't go to Tahoe on it. Well, if you share them, both of those go away, right? That initial high cost of the battery is amortized across a whole bunch of people who wind up using the car. And you can actually buy the car you need, or you can use the car you need for the immediate purpose. When you go to the corner grocery store, it could be a two-seater compact car. And when you want to go to Tahoe, you'll actually get the bigger car. When you share the car, that's all you really need. It's very interesting if you look at what BMW has done with the i3, is basically give you a small, compact, highly efficient, very lightweight city car that is still safe because of the carbon fiber engineering and, and design sophistication, but that get, comes bundled with a certain number of usage days of an SUV when you need that for a bigger trip. That's actually the way we should be thinking about cars as a transportation service offering to mix and match as needed. And if they're autonomous, you can just call it up instantly on your phone and order the vehicle type that you need when you need it. So this is a massive shift. I'll show you two examples of how this is already happening. First, some data that those of you who were here last week um, already saw from the University of Michigan, which is that we actually have already in the US had both peak uh, mileage of peak fuel consumption and peak vehicle miles traveled. So people are moving back into cities, are beginning to share rides. We have higher utilization, particularly here in the Bay Area now of Caltrain and, and transit networks. And this is before the recession. So normally you'd have a, a massive decline during a recession, but this is in 2004 or 2006, depending on which data point you look at. You can also see it show up in our oil imports already. We've had a significant reduction, and actually we're on our way over the next 15 years to become an oil exporter on current trend. Again, lots of things can change that. But if you look at this, about a third of the change is because we increased supply. The light tide oil that we get with our shale gas uh, and some of the new reserves that have become economic as we've improved drilling technology. But two thirds of it is actually from efficiency improvements more efficient cars, better, uh, stricter cafe standards, and then just fewer miles traveled per person. Not well studied, but I think an interesting topic in this that we, we looked at a little bit with some of our students um, is why are 
the actual miles traveled decreasing as well. Some of that obviously is city cores you're revitalizing. But I would argue a, an equally big part is the number of reasons to get in the car has diminished. A lot of it now happens by video conferencing. You do a lot of your shopping online. And Amazon is much more efficient delivering a whole bunch of packages through the city than each of us actually driving to the store separately. And then banking. How many of you actually have gone to a physical bank branch to deposit money with a real human being on the other side? Uh, not many of you uh, in the last year. Uh, so all of that shifting online and all of that from a resource point of view is a massive improvement as well as obviously having been more convenient. That's why many of us have changed it. And I show you this example, a little bit unorthodox for Stanford to show military hardware. Um, but this is our latest aircraft carrier that we're all financing um, at uh, $10 billion, I think, roughly. Um, it's an electric vehicle. It's nuclear powered, which the last uh, whole generation of carriers have already been. But the steam catapults have actually been converted into electromagnetic catapults. The armor and the weapon systems on this are already planned to be converted to be electric as well. And it has a uh, plasma waste recycling plant to turn all of its organic waste into energy as well and feed it back into electricity. So not bad for an arm of the government where we normally think of government as lagging, but actually, in this case, quite far ahead in terms of thinking through future requirements. This ship was, by the way, planned to operate for 90 years, so they had to think uh, ahead. I hope that we actually get that much asset utilization out of it, but we'll see. Um, I'm going to show you just the highlights of buildings. And then there's a manufacturing section in here, too, which you can look up online when the um, presentation gets posted, but I won't have time to go into. If you look at buildings, as I mentioned already, about 40% of all our energy consumption is from buildings. Most of the growth in buildings is happening in one country in the world. About 80% of the increase in building stock is in China. It's the equivalent of 100 New York cities in floor space. So you can imagine the scale. We better get this right, and we better make it efficient. It also depends on the density we do it at. These are two cities with each 5 million inhabitants. But you can see just visually, would you rather commute in Atlanta or Barcelona? Quite apart from which city is more interesting to live in, if any of you have actually <laughs> been in Barcelona. Um, and obviously, that makes a huge difference in terms of fuel consumption emissions, but also in terms of household spending. And I mentioned earlier cement. Look at where China is, a complete outlier on the historic curve of cement consumption. Because China has basically massively built infrastructure ahead of actual growth of its population and ahead of a normal consumption pattern for the growth of the economy. And that's because they've been building highways, lots of cities, quite a fair number of, of rental units that are not actually occupied. But this will come back down. So you can see that. What's a blip in consumption now shouldn't be a linear forecast for will continue. And I'm going to show you two examples of companies that are already making that productivity shift in the building space. What's interesting about buildings is we've actually gone backwards. The house I live in in Palo Alto was shipped out by Sears by rail from the Midwest as a prefab kit. Came with all its nails, paint, all the latest systems at that time, which was electric wiring and, and uh, heating, which was still quite innovative at 1900. Um, now we actually have gone, have gone back to building everything custom stick built in the field with 30% waste. And the single largest fraction of all our municipal waste is construction materials and, and demolition debris. So it's an extremely inefficient industry. It's one of the few industries, if you benchmark globally, that has actually dropped in productivity over the last several decades. Most other industries have gotten better and more productive. Construction has gone the wrong way. This is a company up in Canada called Doing It Right This Time, DIRT, uh, that basically has invented this. And it doesn't look like much. But if you think about how we do construction today, it's nails and screws. The screw was quite an achievement. It has 22 different dimensions it varies on. Took 150 years and two world wars to standardize before that every screw was custom, which you can imagine how painful that is if you've ever had to not have the right size screwdriver, which is only one of the dimensions. But both nails and screws fundamentally, by virtue of their function, destroy what you put them into. You can't unscrew it and then put the screw somewhere else. It'll look really ugly, right? This basically is extruded aluminum and can slide in and lock a structure, provide more support than a screw can, but can be completely removed and reconfigured in a different way. 
a lot of the um, large banks, Google, Apple, are using this way of building out interiors because you can reorganize and reconfigure very quickly as growth changes your demand. You can see here an example of a living room and a hospital. Because it's all factory built, there's zero waste. You can do any kind of mill work. The software lets you basically in real time trade off what cost you want. So all those overruns and, and delays that you're used to from construction and the risk to your marriage, if any of you have ever done construction projects, uh, basically goes away. They deliver three weeks after you press the I want this button. Um, and they do it with typically one error for the entire building. Any of you who've ever created punch lists know that that would be a truly stunning achievement to have only one item wrong in an entire building. And they can do about 30,000 square feet per day um, construction time. Again, a number that's unimaginable if you do it the normal way. And this is a company in China doing the same thing for skyscrapers. Basically, everything is factory built, stacked on top of the floor panel here, hoisted up by a crane, and then bolted into place. Completely reversible. If you wanted to, you could move this skyscraper somewhere else, or you could add to it, or you could change the configuration. It's rated for Richter 9 earthquake, and I don't know if the video will work, but we'll try. Um, there we go. You can watch this, and you, if you look very closely, you can actually see the day-night cycles. Um, it took 15 days, soup to nuts, except for the pouring the foundation a couple days before, to build a 30-story building with all the latest conveniences, appliances, electronic controls, and very high energy efficiency because, again, all of the wiring, all of the insulation is done, insulation, insulation is done in the factory, um, and it's all quickly put together in the field like this. And you can see them snapping together. Only bolts, no screws, nothing that would destroy the material itself. So this is modular building. It's actually a very old concept. The Venetians did this for naval ships in 1400 and were able to dominate the Mediterranean for 150 years simply by being able to rebuild their fleet faster than anyone ever imagined possible. We can now do the same for resource productivity with all of our structures. I want to jump to the end and highlight just a couple implications before we go to questions. First of all, what's the macro picture here if you're designing a business? It's this. The goal here is not just to start with greener, although greener is one element of this, but is really to start with what's on the left-hand side here. How do we make it really convenient, relevant to the millennials? It's got to be orderable on an iPhone easy to use and backwards compatible so I don't have to rip out my entire city infrastructure to be able to adopt these new technologies. I can just add on. And it's got to have new features that surprise and delight in the way that most consumer goods companies think about this. So this is not a geeky technology or wear your hair shirt to sacrifice for the environment. This is actually a productivity shift that gives you more services for less, cheaper and less energy and resource input that gives you the equivalent of the Tesla, right? It's a greener car, but it's also a safer car. It's more convenient, it's sexy, and it's high performance. We don't have to have those trade-offs. We have to get it to be cheaper and at scale. If you try to pitch a green product that's more expensive, there is, in Europe, about 15% of the population, in the US, less than 10, and in Asia, even less than that, that's willing to buy it. But that's a niche product. That's not converting the mainstream of the economy. From a government perspective, we're basically talking about this, which is rather than measuring GDP, we really should be focused on productivity. And we need to roughly, depending on the resource you're talking about, double or triple our productivity relative to historic rates of productivity improvement. If you look at globally, what we're talking about is creating a level playing field by removing all these subsidies for the inefficient way of doing things. We have several trillion dollars globally going into maintaining the status quo on our transportation systems, on our existing energy system, and our existing agricultural system, which gets a huge amount of subsidies to basically produce food, half of which we throw out um, in, in the US on our table or after we've purchased it from the store. What it looks like for a household is that there's a bonanza here. You can get about a third more income 
by just deploying these higher productivity technologies, by sharing your car, making it electric, and having it ultimately be an autonomous fleet that you use only when you need it, or by making your house more modular and more flexible so that as your children grow up, you can reconfigure without having to tear everything down and starting over or moving somewhere else. It's a massive boon broadly for the economy and for the average household, not just for the inventors of this technology, who obviously will stand to make billions as we shift to new technologies. It's also quite a change for anybody who invests and for your retirement portfolios, because there are a whole bunch of products that will be in decline, right? No one's going to buy brakes at the same rate when you have regenerative braking. No one's going to buy parts that go into a mechanical car when most of those are now software features. And on the flip side, you have new categories that benefit. And lastly, and this is my closing slide, what can each of you do? Well, you can change what you eat. And I'm not talking about eating less, although many of us probably should do that too. Uh, I'm talking about changing to eat less protein and eat less beef within protein, more, more vegetable protein and more fish and more chicken. Um, and to also waste less. I mentioned half of the food that we bring home from Whole Foods or Safeway or wherever it is actually never winds up in our stomachs. It's all wasted in the preparation or spoiled or past expiration date. The single biggest decision is where and how you live. If you look at New York versus Kansas, um, where the two Koch brothers live, that's opposite ends of the extreme of the US efficiency, right? New York about four times more efficient than uh, suburbs in small towns in Kansas. And of course, what kind of place you live in, how big it is, how many square feet. There's a, a really lovely book called Not So Big uh, Home, Not So Big House, that basically describes how you can have quality of life without necessarily having a huge amount of square footage. And then lastly, how you get around. Your transportation choices, whether you own a car. I find it fascinating. About a third of the students I'm teaching already don't own a car. And Many of them, at least right now, say they never intend to buy one. Um, so that's a huge demographic shift. And then as we get into ride sharing, we can dramatically decrease congestion and decrease fuel consumption without trading off convenience. Because if it's all an app and instantly available, we actually don't have to make the traditional trade off of, oh, I got to ride the bus for two hours to get to where I want to go. Otherwise, I'm going to consume oil. So this is sort of at the bringing it all down to the ground level. What are some immediate choices to adopt some of these higher productivity technologies that each of us can make. So with that, thank you. And uh, over to all of you for questions. <laughs> Students first. Yes. Um, yeah, a lot of the inventions you mentioned, are, it looks like they're really going to help for new additional sectors, energy, transportation, buildings. Um, well, what about the existing inertia of all of these sectors and um, that we need to kind of combat to reduce emissions now? Like, how do we work on that in a faster way? Yeah, I think there's a couple things embedded in that. One is that we are talking about replacements in an economy like the US, right? If you're talking about China or India, it's mostly about what do we build for the new growth, and that's a, a little bit simpler problem. Here, we are talking about retiring coal plants to, to add solar or to, over time, um, revise our car fleet and, and actually we have to replace cars that we already own with ride sharing or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so that's going to take some level of government intervention to make that happen faster for the, for the environmental reasons. There is an economic driver here that's fundamental, but you know, vehicle fleets turn over every 15, 12 to 15 years, so it would take that long to just run its course naturally. And we can accelerate that with, with government intervention. It also, a lot of this has inhibitory uh, structures embedded in current regulations. Um, and we can remove those. Those of you who've watched Tesla fight to actually make car buying a convenient experience rather than a miserable experience, they've run into lots of barriers from a regulatory perspective of just being able to do that in, in states and cities. So those are all things, factors that slow it down. A lot of our building codes don't necessarily allow the most efficient building technologies. Not so bad here in California with Title 24, but a lot of the rest of the country, you aren't actually allowed to use split system HVAC, for example, and it's all geared towards older technology. So those are all examples of, of being able to accelerate this. On its natural course, it will happen fast enough to add to GDP and to add to productivity, but it won't actually help us hit carbon goals in the time frame that we need. So there's still a reason to actually push 
and not just let this take its natural course. There's also an, a, a variant of your question, which I don't know whether you're asking this or not, but there are industries being displaced by this. Right? So if you're a coal miner, you still have to find a different job or potentially even relocate to a different town. And that's a very difficult proposition with, with a lot of gut-wrenching change. So I don't mean to portray that this is an easy transition. If you look at the last industrial revolution and you were a tradesman, an artisan making things by hand, and it all got turned into a factory that was automated, that was also a very gut-wrenching uh, transition to make, as I'm sure all these horses went through a lot of pain in the transition as well. <laughs> so. Yes? How much of, of these kinds of changes that you're described, how much of those are already factored into models of people and government and so on? Or like the, you said the Exxon doesn't include some of these yeah. kinds of ideas in their model. How much penetration do these ideas have? And, yeah, in these, yeah. Um, so it depends. I mean, the government does plan for the uh, phasing in of CAFE standards, for example. Most of the learning curve effects I described, actually the US has passed a law that the EIA can't take into account learning curves at the rate they actually happen. So that's kind of a weird law to say, ignore physics, but um, do math a different way. So most government planning is not actually involved that level of technology change. Um, if you look at companies, it, the spectrum's all over the map. There are companies that have a shadow carbon price that measure water productivity for their company that are moving very aggressively down this curve. There are other companies who will be just like the utilities and just like the oil companies and be surprised by how quickly these changes happen. Um, so I think, I think you get a spectrum. But on the whole, a lot of our measurements and a lot of our discussion actually needs to be updated to really reflect these productivity shifts. We have a a very strong focus on labor productivity, which is why we've had all this offshoring, outsourcing, automating, uh, mechanizing, translating it into IT so you can, you can have fewer workers. And that's, that's gotten a lot of focus. There's not nearly the same level of focus. Most companies can't tell you if you ask them, what's your water productivity, your steel productivity, your power productivity? Energy is typically something procured seven or eight levels down from the CEO, and nobody has the aggregate number even, let alone actually really measuring productivity of that number. Um, which is what this will actually take in the end. Um, so a lot of people will get, you know, are in for nasty surprises because of that. Yes? This is the fate of the biofuels industry. What's the fate of the biofuels? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't have a crystal ball, so I, I can't tell you for sure. I think that much of biofuels has been difficult because it doesn't allow you to do that productivity shift. It was created to have a lower carbon footprint. Um, if you look at the amount of land it consumes, it in many cases is worse. Some of the new cellulosic or switchgrass or algae wouldn't have that problem, uh, but they still don't work in terms of the cost structure. So my you know, goal chart with the soccer ball, they're not cheaper um, and, and it's difficult to scale them if they rely on any kind of agricultural crop land that competes with food. Um, and so those are big challenges. Now there are down the road technologies that may actually be higher productivity and lower cost point, but all of those are still very early stage. So the current set, I think it's a very difficult shift to make. Um, yeah, and we'll come with you. A, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> on a similar um, note, I'm wondering about uh, carbon capture and sequestration, which is currently very expensive, but if you, if you sort of work in the learning curve to the model. Where did that come out on um, some of those and graphs about the cost of various forms of energy? Yeah, it's a very good question. So the, the curves you saw that I showed um, actually didn't include CCS on top. If you add CCS on top of coal, that curve gets even higher today. It does come down gradually. There is a learning curve for, for CCS technologies. The traditional model of taking the flue gas from a coal plant is on a relatively gradual learning improvement, so it's not at the same rate as solar. So effectively what that means is solar will actually get cheaper much faster and ultimately it will be better to just replace the coal plant with a solar power plant plus storage. Not, the economics don't work yet today, but at the forward projection that's what it looks like. I still think we need carbon capture and storage for two reasons. One is um, we already have so much in the atmosphere that you would actually ultimately want to remove some. Um, Second is we have industrial uses that there really is no good substitute. For the power sector, we can shift to solar, but if we're going to consume any steel at all, there's going to be coal used in that. Uh, similarly, there's CO2 emissions from cement that if we use any cement, we can't really avoid. There are new technologies that use about half the CO2 or emit half the CO2. 
but it's very hard to go to zero. zero. The most promising really though is to shift from that last S of sequestration into a U of usage and to actually find some benefit um, for that carbon, whether turning it into a fuel or turning it into a product that has some functional use. There are actually current efforts underway that are quite far along to do that for enhanced oil recovery. If you look at the total system dynamics, that's still a benefit if you assume that that fuel would have otherwise been burned some by somebody and, and extracted from the ground. It's not as big a benefit because you're actually using the CO2 to get more oil out that's then burned, but it still, it still works. Um, and really the reason for that is oil is such a high price commodity that in the end you actually make the CCS work because that product is so valuable. Um, but if we, need to if we can make other higher quality chemicals, other non-fuel products, then it begins to get very interesting in terms, of, in terms of CCS. I think that's mostly, in my view, that's mostly a solution for the residual that you can't change another way. Um, or for some of the legacy plants that for whatever reason still are needed in that particular spot in the grid. Uh, but many of the other ones, it actually is better ultimately to, to do what we talked about a moment ago and replace with new, more efficient technologies altogether rather than trying to upgrade them. Um, Yes, you're back. Actually, I have two questions. One is uh, uh, related to the energy, the 4D you mentioned, and uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, grid of things. And I wonder how big is the grid? Is the disruption going to come bottom up? Are we talking about optimizing energy usage on a household level, coming up to micro grids, my, uh, neighborhoods, and or we're talking about the large grid and also including transmission, and then we're talking about all the coal plants to be replaced by large solar plants. So that's one of the questions. Second, I didn't say anything about additive manufacturing, which might add to the resource revolution, also on the household level as we replace uh, manufacturing with buying things and also on a larger scale. Yeah, let me address the second one first, actually, in reverse order. There is, I had a whole manufacturing section in my presentation, which you're welcome to look at. It talks about those. Additive manufacturing is a shift. It's not as big as people think, because from a material consumption, you don't actually change dramatically. And from an energy input, it's typically worse today because those are very energy intensive materials to make. There are lots of other things going on in manufacturing that dramatically improve productivity and actually do some of the virtualization of turning things into software. So there's huge opportunity there in, in aggregate. But coming to your, back to your first question on the grid, I think right now we're seeing all of these scales, the change is beginning to happen, right? People are upgrading their light bulbs in their home and adding solar to their roof typically financed by a third party, so that's very small scale. There's an opportunity, which are some of the pilots that we're doing with the students now, to do that at the city scale, at a municipal utility level. Um, it clearly, the integration of solar into the grid for large quantities will have to be managed at a, at a regional or national level. If you try to do that locally, th there's an RMI paper out that looks at you know, going off the grid with storage and solar in your house and sort of saying, I'm gonna island myself. That is clearly not the economically optimal path today because storage is so expensive. It's much better to actually continue to improve the grid. So I do think we need new ways of running the grid at, the, at that scale. And while I think the utility model will change dramatically to, to adjust to all these phenomena, we still do need a wired grid. It doesn't necessarily mean we need a regulated utility in exactly the, the business model that we have today. I think that will actually have to evolve. But it is useful to have the wires and to have a grid. So I think people who say, Forget the grid and, and you know, in a, in a developing country where you don't have a grid today, that may be a cheaper way to go if you're building it new. But in a country like this where we have a grid that works relatively well, um, it's much better to improve that grid than to start over. Uh, do you see like a level coming in, like a micro grid level and maybe neighborhood storage? Uh, or, or that's, we're totally going to avoid it and we're just going to optimize on a household level and use the bigger grid as like kind of cloud computing for, you know. So I, I've, I've seen that come in for campuses. I mean, university campuses are a good example. I've certainly seen that for military bases where they have security reasons to also want to do that. I don't think that you'll see that in, in broad uh, deployment because it's actually much better to manage the, the routing at a larger scale and then to manage the demand management at the local household level of what you turn off. And again, with the, with the communications networks as sophisticated as they already are for data, it's actually pretty easy to manage a much more distributed set of generation and demand points than we thought previously. Previously, we would have needed to aggregate that at some intermediate level. But, but now, you know, if you have Nest thermostats or whatever in your home that can be directly addressed, um, you, can, you can actually aggregate hundreds of points or thousands of points. 
Yes, that's it. Uh, okay, we're done. I'm, I'll still be here for questions if you want.